Welcome to today's vital conversation with our community, the spirit of social change, a conversation between Interfaith Ministries and Project Curate. Interfaith Ministries is pleased to be able to host these virtual conversations on topics with people and organizations in our community addressing crucial issues. We offer our thanks for the support of Citco Petroleum Corporation as the sponsor of our whole 2021 series. Before I proceed, just a reminder that this event is being recorded. Thank you all uh, for, for to those of us who are joining in Zoom, please keep yourselves muted and please use the chat box to send me questions along the way. We also welcome those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Vital conversations emerged after the death of George Floyd, a, Houston, a son of Houston's third ward in May of 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In June, we brought our, together our three amigos, Reverend William Lawson, Archbishop Joe Fiorenza, and Rabbi Sam Karf into dialogue to begin this series. It would be the final time that the three amigos would be together in the same space as Rabbi Karf died that following August. Second summer conversation on allyship followed, and then we began our fall series with a conversation between four outstanding young leaders. And our second fall conversation was with the Fifth Ward CRC and its Center for Urban Transformation. And we concluded last year's season with a vital conversation with um, scholars from Rice University's Houston Education Research Consortium. We began our 2021 series in July with a conversation with Ashley Johnson and Jonathan Brooks from Link Houston about transportation and equity. And our vital August vital conversation with Eileen Morris and Rachel Hill Dixon from the Ensemble Theater was titled Indomitable Spirit, the Strength of Artistic Expression. Please visit imgh.org to learn more about Interfaith Ministries work and how to donate. At imgh.org, you can also uh, learn more about our overall work in the community. And you can also learn about our 2021 series. You'll also have the opportunity to register for our upcoming Vital Conversation episodes, including our October conversation titled um, Welcoming the Stranger, which will focus on IAM's refugee work in Houston, especially in light of our recent work and our upcoming work with Afghan refugees. You can also access the study guide that you can use with our five episodes from our 2020 Vital Conversation series. Today, our theme is the spirit of social change. And we've invited leadership from um, Project Curate to join us. Now, Project Curate is a nonprofit social impact agency that works with religious, academic, and community organizations, and they do so through curriculum development, training, and design. And you'll hear more about uh, the important work of Project Curate in just a moment. I'd like to welcome as our two guests, Brandy Holmes, who is co-managing partner of Project Curate, sharing responsibility for the overall strategic direction, planning, development, and implementation of a range of initiatives and, pro uh, and projects that promote robust civic engagement with diverse public issues around issues of bias, race, equity, and social justice. She's a native Houstonian who combines years of corporate strategy and training experience with a passion for racial and social justice and mentoring young high school students since returning to Houston in 2014, Brandy has focused her attention on various Black liberation struggles, but especially the struggles of Black girls and women. She's a noted social activist, community organizer, and strategist, especially de uh, dedicated to policy and criminal justice transformation and community empowerment. She's a graduate of the University of North Texas with a concentration in marketing. Dr. Rachel Schneider is the co-managing partner of Project Curate and shares with, uh, with Brandy those same responsibilities of overall strategic direction, planning, development, and implementation of initiatives and projects with Project Curate. She holds the PhD from Rice University, and she's a postdoctoral research fellow at Rice, Rice's Religion and Public Life Program. In both her academic and community work, Rachel's work seeks to advocate racial justice, social equity, and human flourishing by attending to the harm caused by white supremacy and anti-blackness uh, su and, anti and working collaboratively collaboratively with others to create change. And she has worked since 2017 with other Project Curate team members to design public curricula that brings together clergy, academics, activists, artists, laity, and students to learn from one another. And with that, I am going to stop my share. And again, welcome everyone who is here and particularly to welcome Brandy and Rachel. And I'm gonna get you both um, spotlighted so that we can see you. Here you come. 
Super. Thank you both for being with us. So let's just start and dive right into the conversation. Um, let's start with learning. I tried to kind of to, to truncate what's on the website because we want to hear from you. Can you tell us a little bit more about Project Curate? What do you want people beyond what's on the website to know about your work and why your work's important? Sure, certainly. I, I certainly love starting the conversation with that question. I just want to thank you, Greg, for the opportunity to be here. Rachel and I are always excited to be in conversation with one another, which we have done quite often, but to do it here and to share a bit more about our work and what we've been learning over the course of the year um, since George Floyd is really a wonderful opportunity. So thank you so much again for the opportunity and for everyone that's here. Um, so to talk a little bit about Project Curate, as Greg mentioned, um, we really are um, trying to address racial injustice at the intersections and also any kind of inequality and equity issues that exist. And we do that by really creating an environment to foster um, liberating public and community engagement practices that really move people into these zones where they can begin to dismantle any sort of barriers that exist along the lines of class, race, sex, gender, and any sort of political orientation. And so we really invite folks into this diverse community to begin to engage in those practices so they can not only learn and understand how those systems um, impact uh, all of us, but also where they can learn solidarity and also network building, which is really important, thinking about how we can work collaboratively across lines and across difference, not only for our personal accountability, for our transformation and for social change. And to put it plainly, I think what's so important with our work is that we really are wanting to create spaces and invite folks, folks into spaces where we can begin to think about how we can be in right relationship with one another, right? So how can we begin to look at the systems um, that exist that create distance, that create division, right? And so how can we get make things right? And how can we create a more just and equitable system and world where all of us, right? Not just the sum, not just the few, but all of us can thrive um, in the current environment. And so our work is really important, like you mentioned, because as we see moments like what has happened with George Floyd or what has happened with Breonna Taylor, right? It's an invitation in these moments for us to pause and it invites new people into conversation, right? And they begin to think about how they can orient themselves towards justice and towards solidarity. And so we see ourselves as a space where people can come and to begin to ask those questions and to become and begin to engage in that type of dialogue in brave and courageous spaces, right, which so often is very difficult to find in this day and age and cancel culture and social media, right, we really are leaning into a model of transformative justice that allows us into enter into spaces of dialogue. So excited about this conversation, because we hope to model just that very thing. Thanks, Brandy. How about you, Rachel? What do you want to add again about the work? And why is it important? Yeah, I mean, I think Brandy really summed it up. I mean, I think this work um, is really about imagining different futures for ourselves. Um, we really see ourselves as, I mean, Brandy and I have really formal titles, but I think our work is really premised on how do we work collaboratively um, with and recognize the wisdom and the leadership and the expertise of communities and people on the ground, particularly those who are historically marginalized and currently experiencing marginalization and um, systemic marginalization and inequities. And so, you know, we're really about how do we create community spaces that really center those voices and experiences as well. And um, also then what does that, what kind of transformation does then that require of how we share knowledge, how we build knowledge and how we build coalitions and collaborative work to tackle issues of injustice. So a bottom up approach, rather than a top-down approach. It's great to hear and really interesting to hear words like brave and courageous, particularly the word imagine. And I've been familiar with Curate's work for quite a few years, even before, uh, you know, summer of 2020, when, um, when many began to can the, the sense of consciousness be 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 uh, be heightened or or a, a greater understanding, but let's let's maybe talk a little bit though about the past year. Can we had leadership um, on 
about a year ago talking about um, the, the concept of allyship. Um, but I, I'd love to hear um, more about what your, all, what your work has looked like, particularly over the past year. So um, maybe you could share some stories or, um, or, or just, I'll just open it up, just share about what this past year has looked like for y'all. Yeah, definitely. I've been thinking a lot about just this past, I mean, really, it's the past year and a half feels like this longest period of time, you know, that that we've been in. Um, but I guess maybe just to broaden out just a bit, a lot of um, what Curate's done is we've, you know, in the past had these um, learning opportunities in our city where, you know, people have really gathered um, and we brought together, you know, community organizers and and community leaders, and faith leaders, and you know, really come and gathered in a space together and been on intentional learning journeys, whether um, it's for you know a curriculum that lasts several months. So that's typically what we've done. Um, but obviously, with COVID nineteen, with ev for everyone, things have changed. Um, and as COVID nineteen really, you know, became the pandemic, really sort of emerged on the horizon. I think. In Curate, we were immediately attuned to the fact that this was going to require, you know, something that we've already been doing, which is engaging with inequities and attending to those who are most impacted. And so, um, so you know, in a way, and it wasn't just the pandemic with COVID-19, you know, we've been long aware, I've heard people talk about it, I don't necessarily love this language, but dual pandemics, pandem the pandemic of anti-racism, or not anti-racism, yeah. the pandemic of racism and anti-Blackness, that has been um, part of centuries of U.S. life. And so, um, you know, I think over the past year, we, there's, a, there's been a need to both recognize what we have survived um, in this nation, uh, the harm that's been perpetuated, um, particularly in relation to Black communities and what we are surviving, because not only have we, you know, are we surviving amidst COVID-19 and the pandemic, but we've also seen these real issues of police violence and the targeting of specific communities um, and the inequitable ways in which the pandemic has unfolded. So all of those issues have been in the background. Uh, and then for us, you know, we've been thinking about you know, how, what does collective human flourishing look like amidst these times and what can sustain us? And, and Brandy mentioned transformative justice and I'll let her talk more about that. But really, what does it mean to name harm and then transform the conditions that cause harm? So that's kind of what we've been thinking about, but practically what we've done, um, one of our programs in particular has been a program called Building Transformative Congregational Leaders. And that's in the midst of the COVID, we'd already had this plan, we'd received funding, we were gonna gather people, we were gonna do all sorts of the cool like field experiences. And of course we had to switch everything online, um, but we have gathered over the last year, 30 to 40, uh, well, it's been about 40 um, faith communities, congregational groups that are saying, we want to pursue and learn how to build justice-driven community, and we want to reimagine our congregational life and learn new practices, and recognizing that to like both support, create justice beyond congregations and churches, but also that our churches need to become spaces of justice. Um, we have been wrestling with what kind of personal transformation needs to happen, what kind of culture transformation needs to happen. And so it's been a year of meeting for four hours every Saturday and really being deep with one another and really attuning to who is in the room and being open to experimenting and being in process together, but really grappling with these issues of how do we name harm, how do we address it, and how do we transform the conditions um, that perpetuate harm and break and both. And so how can we like see these cycles and interrupt them that we have been seeing play out nationally and socially? And I can share more about that later, but if Brandy wants to add anything. Yeah, Brandy, please. 
Yeah, what I was going to add is, you know, one of the kind of core tenets that we really love is a quote from Grace Lee Boggs around transforming yourself to transform the world. And I think what Rachel really highlighted was that while this work is something that we're doing and putting out into the world, this is also work that we all are deeply doing as a team. So it is not so much, I mean, really take a fractal approach, right, to this entire thing to say, hey, what we practice on the small scale is what we're going to see on a larger scale. So if we really are truly a people who want to be committed to transformative justice, committed to seeing change happen, committed to seeing transformation in other folks, we have to first see that in ourselves. And so that has meant that while we are sharing with others, we are also learning and growing as a team. And that work is really important work, I think, as we talk about, hey, what can folks do is, yeah, you really got to begin to do that interpersonal work and then also to do that work as a collective. And so we have, and that's been deep work. It's um, challenging work. It is grat gratifying work. It is wonderful work because you, you begin to see how if we can transform ourselves at this collective level, it is very possible, right? The imagination can begin to believe and to see ways that this can happen on a larger scale. So I think really important to what Rachel has mentioned is we're doing this work as we're living it and as we're sharing it as well. So modeling becomes really important. Again, you're with us with Vital Conversations with our community uh, with Interfaith Ministries. We are with Rachel Schneider and Brandy Holmes from Project Curate. Please um, feel free to ask questions in the chat box if you have that available uh, with us on Zoom. You know, one of the, um, the reasons that I always value uh, discussions with Project Curate is that while I know that you want to see change in policy, and you will take to the streets when it comes to, to, to protest. This, com this, this approach of transforming self, transforming world, imagination, um, I think in many cases are, are, is language and approach, culture and cycles are, are approaches that um, are maybe new to people, um, that, uh, that, that they're maybe a little uh, unusual. But I also know with Project Curate, you're not just aspirational but that you're deeply community-based and community-focused. So I find that your approach is one that I want people to know about and learn about. Um, and, and I also, because Interfaith Ministries, it, it relies so much on the re religious and spiritual and ethical impulse. And when I use that word religious, I use that in a very expansive way, considering how, um, how how diverse our community is and i i want to point people to as well to visit projectcurate.org when when we conclude because you have with some of your guiding principles you're deeply committed developing spiritual practices that allow one to engage in a continual process of self and communal reflection i'll just uh, paraphrase here recognizing divine power in the voices and cultural productions of those historically oppressed engaging with and learning from prophetic forms of witness made from various non-faith orientations, including Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Jewish, humanist forms of thought and practice, which is why we've called this the spirit of social change. I'd love to turn to those stories then so that people can really see that deep kind of intellectual work combined with that kind of grassroots, ground up, community-based work about how you have seen where social change and spiritual practices have intersected. Who wants to go? Brandy, you want to go first? Sure, <laughs> why not? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, definitely. I think, um, you know, um, as, as you mentioned um, in the bio, every time I hear about my bio too, I'm like, is that really me? Fantastic. Who is that? <laughs> Smashing. All right. That's you're even more somebody, amazing. You're even yeah, more amazing. No, listen, somebody else wrote that to me. Brother Cleve Tinsley helped me out on that. So I appreciate having somebody else do that. Uh, but yeah, as you were talking about that, my, I have a um, background and, and really uh, my heart is in community organizing and being out in the streets with the people. Um, and as you mentioned, like thinking about, hey, this prophetic imagination and where is knowledge, where does knowledge come from? Where is it found? We talk about transformative justice. We talk about pod mapping. We talk about all of these different strategies for community organizing, whereas these strategies have been things and practices that the community has been doing for years and eons and ions, right? Like we look at um, right now uh, the response to the COVID-19 and the pandemic and mutual aid, right? Have any Has anybody heard of rent parties, right? Has anybody seen somebody on the corner doing selling cool cups and, and lemonade pops and blow pops and all these other types of things and bake sales, right? Like mutual aid is something that 
the community has done and is doing to support one another. And so we're seeing mutual aid now on a larger scale, right? Well, COVID-19 is affecting folks with wages and evictions and things along those lines. So the knowledge has always and will always be with the people. The people have the solutions and too often, right? There are folks who believe that they have the solution without being in relationship with people. So they seek to serve community, but they cause more harm more violence, more abuse, right? Because they believe themselves to be the source of knowledge and wisdom and not listen to the real source of knowledge and wisdom, which is the people. And so I think that's a really important story as folks are thinking about, hey, how do we help in the pandemic? Or how do we help with um, the recent hurricane in, in Louisiana? Or how do we help in these different situations? And if you're listening to media, right, particularly, they'll tell you that New Orleans is hit the hardest. If you listen to the people, they'll say, no, come down to Homa, you know? come down to some of these other areas that actually this is what was hit um, the hardest. These are areas that we really need more help in because we're rural areas, we often don't get the attention that's needed and necessary. And so, and so a real practice for us is wanting to go where the knowledge is and wanting to get out of the way, right? Provide a resource, provide opportunity, provide space for those voices to be heard. And so my, my work is to get out of the way and to uplift that voice, right? Um, and, and, and given certain circumstances where that voice can't be present due to particular barriers that may present themselves, if that community allows me to speak on their behalf and to represent what they would like to be said in that space because they can't be there, then I'm willing to do that. But I never speak for the community unless the community gives me permission to do that. And so that really that permission-based relationship is really important. I would never seek to speak for a community that I'm not a part of or that has not given me the privilege to do that sort of thing. And so I think that's really important as well. So really it's moving back from parachuting in to being with and being in relationship with, which is an entirely different orientation than what we're used to. It's a conversation about charity versus justice, right? And we're having a justice oriented conversation, which means we gotta be in right relationship with people, which means I can't tell you what to do. You tell me what you need. Yeah, I wanna, I would, yeah, I wanna come back to a couple of things, but Rachel, please. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that. Like, I think another principle that we try to practice and um, that has happened in our building transformative congregational leaders program with our congregational leaders has been um, the, the practice of earned trust. So that's particularly for privileged white folks like you know me, um, that we don't have a right. Like in some ways, I recognizing that any knowledge and wisdom and leadership that is given to us and shared with us from the community, um, we don't have a right to that, but we also need to earn it. We need to become um, we talk about prophetic truth telling. So what are the truths that we really, that I, you know, and my community really need to hear and face and confront and wrestle with? And, um, and are we creating spaces and cultures and communities that allow for that truth to be told? Um, and when it's told, are we welcoming it? And um, so prophetic listening, you know, listening to those truths. So we've had moments where we've had harm done, where we have, you know, these mixed, uh, mixed race spaces with different, you know, gender identities and sexuality, and where there has been real harm caused. Someone said something or done something, maybe out of ignorance, maybe because of social conditioning, um, and it's really had an impact. And so we've had to really pause and really um, hold that and really speak to that. And those are the kinds of practices that we're wanting to also practice, like encourage folks to practice in their congregational or spaces or other faith spaces. Um, and with that, then that, that requires community care, collective care, attending to who is most, um, who has power, who's taking the space, who's making space, um, who's most vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and, but then I guess like clear, like what Brandy said, my role is like clearing the way. Like it's not about me and what I have to say. It's really about what's emerging from the wisdom of the body. And to that end, we have a collaborative team that plans everything. So it's not one person, but really work, we work collaboratively. Let me follow up on just a, a, a couple of things. It sounds to me, Brandy, let me turn back to you that um, 
there seems to be a lot of unlearning or relearning about community engagement that, that, that needs to happen. These are not concepts that sound, at least in my experience and working with others, that, that, that are very familiar uh, of the language of earned trust or prophetic truth telling. So, um, so I, I want to throw out that question about what have you found you needed to sort of unlearn uh, and that would be for you or for Rachel. And I would also want to ask, I, I would think that some people, and I'll just say myself, that I would be worried about being paralyzed by worrying about my well-meaningness, that I think that I'm trying that I'm I'm trying to do my best, but I'm worried about what I've what I'm what I don't know. And so how do you help people also work through sort of that part, that potential paralysis of of being well-meaning, but not exactly knowing how, what to do? You have awesome questions, Greg. Oh, <laughs> jeez. I'm just I'm not just trying to, you know, pat you there. This is the truth. You really got some great ones. I would say um, something that Rachel mentioned so so early on is really so super important um, is that that we're in relationship with one another. So it's not so simply that we are just here talking to you like we are practicing these things and we practice these things in relationship with one another. Now, does that mean that Rachel and I are best? As, so, that, so the key distinction that needs to happen is many ways that we begin to use relationship, right? And take advantage of relationship, right? And exploit relationship. Relationship is not transactional, right? Which is how some ways, unfortunately, some folks engage in relationship with one another. Whereas like, I call this person my friend because we have transacted or shared some sort of resource. That ain't it, right? That ain't it. That may happen, right? You may you may share a resource, but that that to me feels more like a networking relationship, right? And not necessarily a relationship. So moving towards solidarity. That doesn't mean that Rachel and I are gonna be the best of buddies and friends, right? So often we found, or at least that I have found that some of our white brothers and sisters are challenged because they think that we need to enter into kumbaya friendship with one another before we can be in solidarity with one another. No, you don't have to care about my cause to then be able to care about me, right? So so let's 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 see how we can begin to do some work together in solidarity with one another. And while we do that, we may develop a friendship or we may not. But that's not contingent upon you doing justice oriented work. And so it's so important to be in community with folks, right? And it's so important to know that hey, guess what? You are going to fumble and you are going to make a mistake. You fumble and you make mistakes in other areas of your lives as well, right? And what do you do, right? You you look at the situation you take an opportunity to pause, you take an opportunity to put, uh, reflect, and you take an opportunity to assess and if you need to course correct, right? And so just know that in the work of justice work, justice orientation, you are also gonna make a mistake, right? And it's that's okay, right? No one is perfect. And I think we need to really kind of divorce ourselves of that idea. Like we have a real kind of perfectionist mentality in our culture that says, everybody gotta be perfect. I gotta say the right thing. I probably said the wrong thing about 15 times on this broadcast alone, I don't know right? But I'm still here and I'm still going to show up, right? And that's really important. And so accountability in that relationship is important as well. So if I do, right, if I do have a moment where I really kind of step outside or I do have a moment where there's some sort of harm or offense that I may cause, I got somebody like Rachel who will say, hey, Brandy, can we talk after the broadcast? So you said a little something, something, and I just want to call it to your attention. And we move forward in love and care and grace, right? And all of those things. So I think that's really important for someone to say, hey, I'm nervous. I'm going to mess up. You will find you somebody you can mess up with that gives you permission to mess up with them and you just keep it moving. You'll be, you'll be fine. Now, I think it's important to say, I love everything you just said, but I think it's also important to say that the mess up is not only going to be on people who are not people of color, like people of color we met, first of all, we don't even sometimes know everything that we need to know about our own culture and about the own, the things that we have um, had happened to us. Um, recently participated in a transformational African-American leadership in the Church Universal. That was the focus of the cohort I was in for my doctorate. And that was, there were things that I learned, you know, that have happened. And I, I'm a, I have a minor in African-American studies. I'm black, I thought, I, you know, so there are things that we know that we still have to learn. And there's also, we, we're we not the expert on everything. So we've all got to kind of come to it with, hey, we're all trying to learn and be better together. So, I mean, I love what you guys are doing. Uh, Matt Russell was my professor when I was working on my master's 
that's how I first heard about Project Curate. And um, I love the work you guys are doing. I, I'm very excited about everything y'all do. So yeah, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you bringing up that point, right, and highlighting that because that is that is important. I'm I'm going to, of course, right. I don't know everything there is to know about orient, sexual orientation. I don't know everything. There's so many different. I don't even know everything that I may do around class, right. Um, so there's so many different ways that you mentioned that we all have to do our work. It's not just a white kind of black, but you know, pri primarily what we're experiencing here in this country. But there is so much work that has to be done. To your point, Rachel, I think you were going to say something. Yes. Yeah, I thank you so much for that comment. Um, and it's, it is so important. I mean, I think what I'm continually practicing in my work with Project Curate is, and what, what we're trying to do in our community programs is learning how to to build like, like what do we need to sustain us and keep us resilient so that we can continue to show up? And I think, you know, we have this whole discussion about like white fragility, you know, in the larger culture and context, which is essentially like, but I mean, it boils down, you know, regardless of what you think about that concept, it boils down to, you know, you know, so often I think well-meaning, well white folks come in and they want to get involved. You know, we saw a lot of people contact us after George Floyd's death. They want to do something. And then when they feel uncomfortable um, or have some, have people speak back to them and say, no, actually, this is not what we need, or this is what you need to look at, then there's a kind of collapse or paralyzing, like you said, Greg. And so what does it mean to address things, confront them, reflect, you know, we really reflect on oneself. Why am I getting so emotional or stuck here? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? But then also making apologies, making amends, and also continuing to move forward so that we're not thrown off or the work stops because we have to keep in mind that the overall goal is working and moving together towards right relationship, towards justice. And so um, that's kind of, you know, we just keep coming back to that over and over and over. Um, and I had something about unlearning, but we can come back to that, like an example of things that we're unlearning. We have unlearned, we need to unlearn collectively. But I just wanted to, to say that it's about kind of, what do we need to do to address things as they come up so that we can keep showing up? Yeah. And I see, I see a hand up as well, Randy. I'm going to get to you in just a second. And I also just wanted to recognize the comment from uh, Reverend Tammy Wilson, who is on the board of directors at IAM and also is the co-chair of our Interfaith Relations and uh, Community Partnerships Committee. So, uh, and and is a and, and is a good good friend. Again, the the words that you use. Um, Trans and I know that I would I want to hear about transformative justice, but just the concept of transformation and change, and as we mentioned, prophetic truth telling, um, these these are words that we often hear out of these spiritual and and religious and, and ethical traditions. So, I, I'm wondering if we could spend a little time as a maybe as a, a segueing over into. Um, maybe with 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 keeping confidentiality maybe some specific kind of anecdotes or vignettes from these 40 faith communities that you've worked with um regarding this kind of this again to, to focus on the spirit of social change what sort of change and, and struggles have you seen come out of these cohorts that you've been working with over the past over the past couple of years or the past year Rachel, can I, you want, you want, just to, for the sake of just um, making a choice, Rachel, can we start with yeah, you? Yeah, um, you know, that's just really interesting. I mean, thinking of spiritual practices, I think one of the things that we have sought to challenge um, in our um, congregational leader program is, you know, what are our sources? What are, what are the things that we rely on for our spiritual sustenance. So, so often we have these traditional texts and we look for places in traditional, you know, organizations, but we've really sought to like, so we've, we've incorporated particular practices that, you know, come out of, you know, many contemplative traditions, but that involve deep reflection and grounding um, to really begin our time together. But then we've utilized, um, we've utilized 
pow like powerful voices that maybe we don't typically see as sources of spiritual wisdom and leadership. And we've used image, we've used contemporary black art to really reflect. Um, we've used, uh, you know, the words of Audre Lorde. We've really, um, we've really wanted to um, really begin, like we said in one of our principles, recognizing divine power in the voices and the uh, wisdom of the oppressed. And so we that's how we often begin our sessions. And one of the things that I think was most powerful this last session, we were coming on to December, as you know, by this time for religious leaders in particular from, you know, this is a very hairy time and we were in the midst of the pandemic and our team just recognized that we had a plan for how we wanted to, you know, go forward. And we just recognized that really what was needed in our December session was, um, was a real slowing down and emphasis on community care and just like tending to our spirits. But what came out of that was a recognition and a re not reimagining, but a really re a reconnecting to the idea that are of Sabbath as resistance and recognizing that for, for Black communities and so and many other communities in the US, historically and contemporary, what are the systems that are that make it so that there is no rest? You know, thinking about Brianna Taylor. Um, whose rest was violently interrupted. Um, and, you know, so really grappling with, you know, rest is available to some and not others. And why is that? And then what does Sabbath as resistance mean in that context? It's an opportunity and a call to divest from unjust systems. And we have an amazing um, member of our planning team Andrea Sawyer, who led us in this profound meditation on the Ten Commandments and how then, you know, how observing the Sabbath is so tied to divestment from injustice and loving neighbor um, and how intertwined these are. And so, you know, it's really refocused us in many ways. That session really refocused us on spirituality for the long haul. But also we don't just do, we don't just practice like a bubble bath for self care, you know? That's not what this is about. And we also have to grapple with um, why, why there is no rest. What are the cries of you know, injustice that we need to be uh, listening to? And in that COVID, you know, we think of our essential workers, you know, all of those layers were what we unpacked. Thank you. Brandy, please. Yeah, and I would say, Rachel, um, just beautifully, I mean, if we're talking about a basketball game, and this was a wonderful assist, and I'm going to go and MJ it into the hole, because she mentioned like, hey, who who can't who can't rest? And what are the systems that make it possible for folks not to be able to do that? And how do we address the root cause of that harm? And that's what transformative justice is, right? You ask that question, around, hey, what is transformative justice? And how do we begin to practice that? And transformative justice is really a framework um, an approach to think about how to respond to this violence, how do we respond to harm, how we respond to abuse, and how do we do it in such a way that does not create more violence, create more harm, or create more abuse, right? And so, like she mentioned, is really looking at and acknowledging, right, and beginning to think about how we can enter into right relationship with one another. But in order to do that, we have to acknowledge the root cause of the harm, the root cause of the violence, right? So we have to name, which is important in the prophetic truth telling, is we have to name these things. We cannot be afraid to use terms like white supremacy and racism and anti-Blackness and anti-immigrant sentiment, right? We have to begin to call these things as they are, which is a spiritual practice, right? Until we until we do that, and if we run away from those things, right, we never can begin to address them. And so one of the key tenets of transformative justice is really acknowledging um, the cause of harm and the root cause of harm, and also looking at what types of things can we create? What types of new systems, right? What kind of ways can we deconstruct and in some ways abolish certain systems, practices, infrastructures, right, that create and continue to perpetuate those types of harm. And so when we do that, right, we begin to imagine, which is a really fun space to be in, imagine worlds like Rachel mentioned, right, this prophetic imagination, hey, what type of world can we exist in and what can we create together here in this particular community? So like she mentioned, 
like this rest, this Sabbath as resistance really introduced an opportunity for us to think about not only our own personal care, but communal care, right? So communal care, which is so often so very important. And so that, that really is the heart of this transformative justice model and also how we can begin to practice that um, with ourselves, right? Because there might be some things that we need to transform within, right? And also how we do that across community and with others. Oh, there's just so I mean, so much there, but I, I'm hoping that what people are hearing is not, I would say, I, I would describe it perhaps as new or innovative language or an understanding of community change. Um, but I would also propose that these some of these practices are very, very old and ancient that we have forgotten. So I'm wondering, Rachel, if we could uh, maybe to pivot back to you, I, I, I would like to, to hear a little bit more about that unlearning, but perhaps a little bit about what you've discovered as well, um, that many of these practices have been available to us and literally in front of our faces for 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 generation and either been forgotten, or they've been um, they've been suppressed. So uh, I, I, I know you wanted to say something about the unlearning, but I'm wondering if you could maybe riff a little bit on on what we've discovered or rediscovered as well. Well, I mean, I think I was going to come back to that Sabbath is resistance idea, because part of what it's unlearning is, um, you know, it, we have these cultures that are so fueled by inequality and inequity. Um, our economic system rests so often on, you know, like I can enjoy rest and leisure because someone else is working for me and their labor is being used. Um, and so really, I think reimagining um, and, and, and beginning to think about what does it, I wrote this in the chat, how can we create the conditions where all can experience rest and flourishing? It's not um, just the privilege, the privilege of a few. And so what would it mean? Like, so then it's the unlearning, like what are the patterns and the cultures, you know, whether it's of, you know, what counts as productivity and success, you know, and how we, you know, get focused on certain outcomes versus, you know, what does it mean to learn to create communities where, um, you know, particularly those who have not been allowed rest in our society are not subjected to more harm. So when they come into our faith communities, um, that they're not subjected to more harm and just the same patterns and systems that happen outside of our communities. Um, so that's really where the, the real, and it's, it's an ongoing process of learning and unlearning that happens through daily practice and that deep listening that we've already talked about. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is going back to our faith traditions, we've been really um, moved, like it came through, I mean, we didn't have this planned, but it came through the process of meeting monthly. But really what began to emerge was what are we holding on to? We're so, um, we're so scared to step into the unknown often or it's uncomfortable, but, but really, um, risking and trusting the spirit to move forward and having courage to imagine anew. And that's, I think, the best of our faith traditions give us the tools to imagine better worlds and uh, remind us that things are not always what they seem. And so uh, that, I think, is this beautiful invitation and trusting the wisdom of the body. Yes, the some of us. Um, that's what, uh, that is what I think we continue to come back to again and again, is this is not one person or reliant on one person and their knowledge or their action. We do this together and together we know a lot. Thanks. Um, I just want to run through the chat very quickly because what we found is a lot of of points that people have found uh, resonance with. Um, we don't uh, we don't often admit, but we have levels of preconceived notions. We expect certain attitudes and behaviors based on what we've heard or seen. So I think it sounds like that reflective work is so important to be more aware of what we've uh, what we've sort of assumed based on our own experience. 
um, uh, just the comment on unconscious bias, uh, lots of books, uh, fierce conversations. There's a question about the source of, of funding for Project Curate. I think your the website has kind of your, your, your major uh, funders listed on, on that. So I don't know if we'll get to that question, but I know that projectcurate.org um, uh, talks about supporters and collaborators. Um, lots of connectors and con uh, uh, connection um, suggestions in your comment where all can rest and flourish. Um, uh, so let me let me turn to kind of the next question. Brandy, can I ask if you'll start again, what does success look like for y'all at Project Curate? I, I, I'm not to backtrack us, but I wanted to Please roll do. back. I wanted to roll back on something where you mentioned um, a bit earlier around the practices, right? And some of these ancient practices that were available and it's kind of returning to some practices. And what I do think is important to mention um, is that a lot of the departure from our, the departure or awareness of ancient practices is uh, by way of colonization, right? Um, and to say for the folks, the people of the global majority is we may be distanced from these practices due to colonization, right? And so I think it really is important as we're thinking about, hey, what are these ancient practices that exist? One thing that we do at Project Curate is a course name and acknowledge the source of the practice right and to acknowledge the fact that this may have existed as an ancient African spiritual practice this may have existed as a ancient um, indigenous people's practice and so I think that's so very important is to not only take right we've seen like taking and the commodification of certain practices and not really honoring the source of the knowledge. And I really think that's important to think about how colonization, right, and the need to decolonize has affected us all. And it's very important. So we might be distanced from those things because of colonization. So I think that's important. So I just wanted to say that because it was hitting me a little bit as I was thinking through that. Um, but success is such an interesting word um, that, that to me really kind of moves into like, you know, I got a business background, so it takes me back to like strategic plans and ROIs and all that other kind of stuff. And so it's like, you know, for me, what for me, I would say, um, you know, what the thing that I really look at and measure for for our work is, is how are we moving towards solidarity and practices of solidarity with other peoples? And how are we moving towards liberation? That's that's really the measures for me. It's like, how, how are the things that we're doing, the, the work that we're putting out, the conversations we're contributing to, how are we moving folks towards their own liberation, not only individually, but collectively? And so that to me is what a measure, if we had to use terminology success would be. And so are folks now feeling more liberated in their actions? Are they feeling more so now that they are more in aligned with their, uh, with their values and with their practices? Are they really practicing justice, right? And moving towards liberation. So for me, those are really measures of success. And so that shows up in now, do they have new, like you mentioned, right? Do they have new and innovative language that really can describe practices that they've always had, but they never knew that's what they were doing, right? That to me is a liberating practice. Like, man, I'm really, I'm out here jobbing it. I, jobbing it takes me back real 1970, my bad. I don't know where that came from. Anyway, I'm out here really doing that thing, right? And so I think that really to me um, is a measure of, hey, folks now have new knowledge, new consciousness, new awareness. And not only do they have that knowledge, they're actually putting that into practice. So we're not just another book study, which is nothing's wrong with a book study, but we're not just a book study or we're not just another, another opportunity to intellectualize, right? These, these concepts, but to actually take these things from head to heart, to feet, to arms, to movement, to whatever we're, um, we're, we're, we're trying to do. Rachel, same question to you. And again, challenging this concept of, thank you for again, challenging the, the, the concept of success. That's super, super important. But I'd, I'd love to hear from, from you both, either both the challenge and how you would also define what it means for Project Curate to be successful. Yeah, I mean, I think Brandy said so much that was just right on. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is we've been really influenced by an amazing uh, writer and activist named Adrienne Marie Brown. And I think one of the things that she's written a, a book called Emergent Strategy. And one of the things that I think, you know, she's worked with many organizations and organizers and nonprofits over the years. And one of the things that she really challenges that I think has been so formative for us is, you know, where success is, you know, in movement work, you know, and we can extend that really broadly to just justice and equity work. 
um, because, you know, she's really calling us to, and, and I think this is what we try to do is to not disregard the small scale and the small changes. It's this fractal approach that Brandy mentioned earlier, that like in order to see what we want to see on the large scale, we have to be able to practice and sustain it on the small scale. And that the, the changes, they cycle upward. And so I would just say that success isn't, you know, we're not going to necessarily be able to measure it in huge public policy changes, though we hope that our work moves people towards showing up in really and creating systemic and structural change where it really matters. But, you know, really it's about do our organizations look different? Do our boards look different? Do our, um, does our, um, do, does our leadership model look different? Um, who's in the room, not just who's in the room, but whose voice is centered, whose experience and wisdom is recognized and compensated. You know, these are the, uh, the very practical things that I think, um, that I think really matter and count as success in this work for the long haul. And I, I wasn't going to ask her to, uh, I wasn't going to, to, to call her out, but I'm glad she put it in the, in the chat. Uh, Marjorie Joseph, who's the executive director of Houston Coalition Against Hate, their day of perspective, an event that they're hosting is actually going to feature Adrienne Marie Brown. So um, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a link in the chat box and we'll make sure to send that out. I'm, I'm really excited about, about that event. Let me, let me turn to the, to the last question for both of you. And, and Brandy, let me, let me turn back to you. Um, people tune into these vital conversations, not just to learn, but what they can do. What, again, what's kind of your, your final message? What can people do? What kind of spiritual practices are you seeing in the community that foster change? That's a, I'm, I'm kind of loading the question, so I'll just return. What do you want people to do after they, after this concludes? Brandy, please. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's a lot that folks can do. I think it really does have to, I don't think there's something that I can prescriptively say to you is the one thing that you can go and do. I think you you have to really assess kind of where you are um, and even your capacity and really what what you're willing to do and what, in some ways, what risk you're willing to take as well. And so I could simply say, hey, go and um, find out when the next um, when the next protest is and go out and do that, but that might not be the right action for you, right? And we all don't have to have, and I say this often, you don't have to have a black belt or a degree in activism 101 and social justice 101 to enact change. And so you really have to look at your own current your own environment and say, hey, in this current space that I live in and I exist in, what are some ways that I'd like to see transformation happen? What are some ways that I like to see change happen? It, as it relates to any sort of justice particular orientation as well. So I think it's important for us to begin to look at our own environment, our own community, and then also kind of move into, hey, who can I enter into relationship with, into conversation with, that I can gain some wisdom from? Not so much where I'm coming to, you know, hoard all the resources, it's a one-sided thing, but how can, hey, do you have a moment for you to just, I just want to learn, do you have a any time to share? It would be my privilege, I'll pay for a lunch, I'll give you whatever, you know, what, what is it that we can do, right? And so I think that really is a critical first step. And there's so much, so many resources available online. There's so much that's available to kind of guide and direct in those sort of ways. And I would say we also are a resource as well for folks who are wanting to begin to engage in conversations and dialogues around these types of topics too. Brandy, before I turn to Rachel, I think those are really important. And I often think those are overlooked because they're really difficult. I remember after the murder of George Floyd, many people called and said, what should I do? Who should I, can you connect me with, with, with somebody? And how much energy there was. And I told people, put yourself a, a, a reminder six months from now and see, and, and then do a hard reflection on what you promised or what you wanted to do. And they're often these big things. Uh, and, and, and Adrian Marie's Brown notion of kind of fractal change, I think is a very, very, very important one for people to consider because it's substantive, it's doable, but it's also very difficult because in some ways going out and doing, trying to figure out the big thing to do is, is, is sometimes is, is easy. It's, it's, an easy, it's an easy move that then doesn't happen. So um, I, I, I very much thank you for, for, for that. Rachel, how about you? Kind of what's, what's your last takeaway for our, from our time together? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think I always, we always talk about, Brandy talks about this as well. And, um, you know, what is the, but actually a, a, I was first introduced to this phrase by a, a black South African woman um, who was facilitating a conversation on diversity, social justice and equity. But what is the next best elegant step? What is the next, like, you know, I think I really just always um, invite people to really consider where they're at and what that next step is. And, you know, there's so many resources available to educate yourself. So if that's the next step, commit to it, you know, um, and don't necessarily look for, you know, like you, you can do that at any time and in any place, but also pushing beyond just another book study, um, which again, there's nothing wrong with book studies, but what does it mean to be in a, can you find a communal space where you can be, can you begin to develop that deep reflection, space for deep reflection and conversation, but also accountability for taking action. Um, and then the, the last thing I would say is just a plug. I'm gonna put my email in the chat because we're about to uh, embark on our second cohort for the Building Transformative Congregational Leaders Program. So if you think that we'll, we'll be running four more cohorts over the next four years. So if you think that that might be something that you and your community could benefit and we have a broad definition you know, of congregations, um, please, please send me an email. So uh, that's a short plug, but I just, I, that's something practical too. If you, if you really want to take the next step um, in your faith community, um, yeah. If you're not on the Zoom, you can also go to our website and do the contact us uh, little option there as well. And um, you can send an email that way too, if you go to projectcurate.org. And we're, I mean, again, not to plug us too much, but we're also available for individualized work with organizations and we do consulting. So, you know, if any of this has piqued your interest, I do want to offer us as a resource. Well, I'm pleased for you to give the long plug, not just the short plug. And, and that's, that's intentional. Our vital conversations are designed to be with vital organizations doing vital work that I think people need to know about. And we at I am feel are, are strong partners and collaborators um, in, in the community. So I'm, I, I try to plug Project Curate as, as often as I can because I know how important your work is, but I also know that you're not territorial about the space as well, that you're seeking to collaborate because, because it's not a zero-sum game. And so, um, Again, there's a, there are a lot of very uh, um, uh, your comments that you've added in the in the chat as as kind of highlights as well as people who have I think very much resonated with with what you have with, with what you are doing. Um, I want to be mindful of time. We're coming up on twelve fifty seven or so. Let me see if there are any. There's again a variety of of thanks that are starting to come in. Um, I just want to say, Greg, real quick, thank you. I've got to yep. go to another meeting. But um, this was awesome. I knew it would be. Um, and, and I look forward to how we can engage with you guys in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I did see, I don't want to, I do have time for one question. Vascola Stoney, who is also part of, of some of our, in, uh, our interfaith work. If you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question, I see your hand up. Right. And it's not, thank you. It's, and thank you, Brandy and Rachel for, I mean, such an engaging and, um, uh, knowledgeable conversation. I've, I've learned so much and it's amazing what we thought we knew. And then when we are, we open our ears so we can hear, um, then we can hear more. But I, I, I think as just something that might give us all some comfort, I'm, I think of a puzzle and, um, and putting the pieces of a puzzle together, we build the edges first, that is the foundation. And then we put the pieces, we start to put the pieces in the middle. And I think the foundation for us is, is trust and relationship. And once we have that, then those pieces, because if you leave the edges open, something can slip through. But when you build that relationship and you, and you build that trust, then all the other pieces that come in, um, are, can, are, are, it's easier for them to find their place. And so that's just you know, one of the things that, that just comes to mind because when we talk about this issue has so many different 
different pieces. Um, the more we talk, the more we find out that this needs to happen and that thing needs to happen. And we have our own personal things. And then there's fun, just so many different pieces to this puzzle, if you will. But it's a beautiful puzzle, um, Brandon, when you talk about uh, prophetic imagination, when you see it, it's beautiful. And it's as, as the way God sees it, the way he intended for it to be, that we all live together um, as in harmony as one. And so that just to just kind of help us understand, it's not an easy thing to do. But when we are determined to do it um, for the good of the people of the kingdom, then it, it, can, it can be done. So thank you. Amen to that. Thank you. Brandy Holmes, Rachel Schneider, Project Curate, thank you so much for your, for your time. Um, again, I invite you all to visit projectcurate.org. Rachel put her information in the email, in, in the chat box as well, and we'll follow up with, it, with an email as well. Let me just have a couple of final notes. We hope to see you for our October Vital Conversation with Refugee, Refugee Services on October the 7th, focusing on the concept of welcoming the stranger. But before then, we hope um, you can join us for a set of workshops. We called dialogue workshops that I think aligns well with what um, with what Project Curate does as well. And I've, I've dropped the, uh, the, the link in the chat box. Today in communities across the United States, we find ourselves in a time in which we have the inability to talk about divisive issues. Uh, and to help faith communities, Interfaith Ministries has partnered with Braver Angels, which is a national nonpartisan organization. We've got dialogue workshops coming up in, uh, on September 28th and November the 9th. Um, and these, uh, these um, workshops foster understanding of other perspectives, not by changing anyone's minds, but rather by advancing skills for listening and discourse. So we'll follow up with information as well, but we invite you to visit imgh.org and click on our um, dialogue workshops link to learn more. Again, thank you all for joining us today. You can learn more about Project Curate at projectcurate.org. You can learn more about us at imgh.org to learn about Interfaith's work, how to support us, how to support and get involved with us and you know, wonderful organizations organizations like Project Curate. Thank you again to Sitco Petroleum Corporation for sponsoring this episode and the series. Um, Rachel and Brandy, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for your time. And we'll see you next time for our vital conversation. Bye, everybody. <laughs>